Um, I want to thank God, right? Our higher power, the universe, because I'm alive today, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm grateful, like, attitude of gratitude, right? Um, I'll qualify that I belong here, but I don't usually share about my drug log. We all know how to use drugs. That's why we're here. Um, but I started at a very young age, right? Um, when I grew up, it was 1975. Coors had these little tiny beer cans, and my dad thought it was really cool to give them to me. Um, I remember eating baby aspirin because it tasted good, not because I was sick or had a headache. Um, you know, and it, they talk about the progression of the disease, right? So like by the time I was in third grade, my mom thought it was cool to give me weed for my asthma. So I was smoking weed and I thought it was normal to go through the house and pick up all the roaches and put them in a cigar box so that when mom was broke, I'd be like, here mom, right? And so as Tony was talking about like high school and junior high and being high, like I remember like I had to leave school because everybody was a comic strip. Like I had to go home. Um, and by the time I got to high school, my dad would drop me off in the front and I would boogie to the back and go have fun all day. Right. Um, now, mind you, when I was in high school, I was training to go to the Olympics as a swimmer. And everything got in the way of that. Um, so my senior year was spent going to school all day, going to summer school, and going to night school just so that I could graduate. Because I ditched for three months straight and thought I had it all figured out. Signed my dad's name, pulled the mail. I forgot they might call him at work. And so, you know, um, I had some normalcy, you know. I got married, I had kids. Um, but even that was a disaster, right? Because although I loved him, uh, I never promised in front of God and the church and everybody that watched us get married that I would get my ass kicked every day, right? And like, that was normal for me because growing up as a kid, the people that I should have been able to trust the most were the ones that gave me the biggest violation of breaking my trust. And I thought that that was normal too, because I didn't know any better. Um, I did crank too, but it didn't calm me down. <laughs> it made me a hot mess. Um, and you know, basically I, I was a very functioning addict, right? I was a monitor tech. I was responsible for 30 people and their heart rhythm. Like I was supposed to watch them so that I could catch something so that if, you know, they might code and die. And I was getting high at work. And my life was very unmanageable, but I didn't want to see it because I was swimming in the denial, right? Even my girlfriend pulled me to the side and she was like, were you just in the bathroom? I was like, yeah, why? And she's like, well, you left particles of what? She's like, well, were you doing lines on the back of the toilet roll dispenser? I was like, yeah. I'm like, you want some? <laughs> um, and like I laugh because that's all I can do is laugh about it, right? Because I couldn't make this shit up if I tried because I was literally the most dumbest criminal ever. Like, yeah. So my life was quickly unraveling. So I thought, oh, I'll just move to Oregon. I'll get a job at the hospital where my mom works and I'll just move, right? I didn't know what a geographical was. I didn't know I was gonna find me wherever I go, right? You guys taught me that when I got clean and I came here and I was like, wait, what? So uh, I came up here in 2004. I had a job working at St. Vincent. Again, I was a monitor tech. Only this time I was high on methadone. Not now. And I didn't have 30. I had 60. And then I met the love of my life. Chris, Crystal Meth. <laughs> yeah. And that's when my life was way out of control and I thought shit was normal, right? I thought it was normal to walk 27 different ways to get home because you couldn't walk the same way twice because somebody might be following you. I thought it was normal to have a camera in the peephole so that you could be watching what was going on in the parking lot. 
And I also thought it was normal to have an extension cord from the next door neighbor to your house with 27 cords going everywhere because you didn't have power. So pray that nobody kicked one of the cords because then the lights would go out, right? And I thought that was normal. I thought it was normal to leave my daughter unattended, right? She was 14 years old. She didn't know how to take care of herself. That was my job, and I failed. You know, she grew up in a house where there might be groceries. I might come home. I was at the bingo hall playing bingo because I was wired for sound, so I just had to be gobbing all day long. Um, and then I got tired. I got tired. It was like there was just too much shit going on all the time, right? And I'm going to cuss, and I'm sorry I'm in the house of God. I'm sorry. Um, and I was tired, and I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. So there was a sober living in Hillsboro, and... Um, I didn't have insurance, I didn't have money, I didn't get to go to detox, I didn't get those wonderful meds to help you, you know, ease out of it. I literally stopped cold turkey taking methadone, kicked on a couch and went into sober living because that's how serious I was, right? Um, I had 79 days clean and my dad died. Now, in those 79 days, I wasn't doing the work. I sat in the back. I thought everybody was full of shit. They can't be happy that they're not getting loaded. There's alcohol in their coffee. And um, when I went home to be the good daughter and plan his memorial, I didn't have the tools to stay clean because the pain of losing my dad was too much. And I didn't want to feel it. So um, it was the day of his memorial, and I was sitting in the garage because I'm from Fresno, so it's like we do a lot of garage sitting um, with the air conditioner, like a swamp cooler in the doorway to kind of keep it cool. <laughs> uh-huh. um, and if you guys have ever seen The Shining, when Jack Nicholas is in the bar and he said, I'd sell my soul to the devil for a drink. That was me. I was sitting on the couch and I remember looking at my cousin and I said, give me the pipe. And he's like, didn't you have a problem? I said, just give it to me, I'll be fine. Well, once you put the jack in the box out of the box, it's really hard to put him back in, right? So I was off and running, not paying attention to my kids, not going to see my kids. I didn't give a shit about my kids because I was busy doing other things, right? And I too looked in the mirror one day and I was like, wow what happened, right? There's this picture that I have and I look like E.T. Like I have this big bobble head, but the rest of my body's really skinny because that's all I did all day long. My diet consisted of um, fried tortillas with cinnamon and sugar and a couple shafts of sodas. And I would smoke cigarettes all day and then I would crash and then that repeat like all day, every day, right? Um, And then one of the homies from Oregon came through and he picked me up and took me to Southern California. Now, I say this because I'm super grateful for shitty friends. Right? I'm super grateful for those friends that came and got me and left me. Right? The homies, I got your back, I got you. Bullshit. It's all lies. It's all lies. Because when I really needed him, he left me. When I didn't have money, when I didn't have drugs, when I didn't have something that he needed, he left me. And I remember looking on a map where I was because I was in Costa Mesa, but I didn't know where that was, right? I'm like, am I still in California? And then the freeways and everything, right? So there's zigzag here, there, and everywhere. And I was like, oh my God, where are we at, right? And I laugh now because uh, where I used to live, there was like five freeways within a five mile radius of me, right? Because we're just freeway city. Um. I managed to uh, meet this lady. She let me sleep on her couch for a small fee. And uh, I ended up getting kicked out of the dope house, right? And this was the beginning of the end for me. Uh, Everything I owned was in a paper bag, right? I looked like a jack-o'-lantern because I had some teeth. Some teeth were missing, but that was okay, I thought. Um, And so what happened was I met this guy, right? And this guy came to the spot and He had been to prison and he was living in a sober living 
and he and I became friends and he would come and take me and make sure that I ate and that everything was okay. And so the day that I uh, got kicked out, I called him and his family came and got me and gave me a safe place to stay and then took me to an Alano club the next day, right? Now, our, our uh, basic text talks about when the pain is great enough, right? you'll do something about it. And then in recovery and relapse, it talks about a nuclear blast getting you to move, right? So I had to hit rock bottom. And if you think rock bottom is the bottom, it's not. Rock bottom has a basement. And that's where I had to go. So I went into that meeting and I raised my hand and I just threw up all over the meeting. My name is Carmen and I'm an addict and I don't have anywhere to go and I don't know how to do this. I know I don't wanna get loaded anymore, I need help. So this girl was like, well, we have an opening in our sober living. So I piled up in a car full of people. I didn't know who they were. I could have been chopped up all the way to Mexico. I don't know. But the lady, she let me stay there, right? Because my dad always told me, mija, you'll be taken care of. When I'm gone, you'll be taken care of. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. But he wasn't lying, right? My dad... I don't know, he did something. He worked for the Pacific Gas and Electric for like 33 years, and so I get a portion of his pension for the rest of my life. But that allowed me to move into sober living, and the lady said, I trust you that you will pay me. And that was a foreign concept because nobody trusted me. They would lock their purse up in the car, lock the garage door, and (laughs) have eyes on me all day where where I'm at, what am I doing? And I used to say like, I'm not an addict like that. I, I'm not a thief. I never stole from anybody. And um, this person pulled me to the side and said, you stole a daughter from the mom and you stole the mother from the children. I was like, okay, well then I am a thief. And when I first got here, I kept looking at the differences, right? Like I didn't think that I belonged here. I'd never been to prison. I didn't have a rap sheet a mile long. I didn't have a Bonnie and Clyde story. I never discharged a number, right? But I do belong here. Why? Because my life is unmanageable when I put some foreign substance in my body, no matter what it is. If it changes my mind and my mood, I want it, right? I mean, even a cheeseburger, right? Eating carbs will change you. It'll make you happy for a minute. So... That was the beginning of my journey, and I haven't looked back. My clean date is March 13th of 2010, and I've never had to change that date from that date forward, right? Um, When I had six months clean, I jumped into service. I didn't know they could fire you from volunteering, but you have to show up. I was like, okay. Um, From there, I have been a GSR, chip chick, uh, of service to area, H&I, secretary, all the way up to conventions. That's my jam, conventions. That is my thing, right? I've been part of a convention committee for 13 of the 14 years that I've been clean. Um, And you know, the reason why they tell you about being of service is because it gets you out of self, right? It's kind of hard to be selfish if you're helping someone. They low-key did that though, right? Because you don't really realize that because you're having fun. And conventions, right? Like my first convention was Palm Springs and I totally tripped out because I was like, I don't think those guys are supposed to be talking to each other. And everybody was getting along and everybody was like loving everybody and like showing each other respect. And I seen this keychain, right? This chick had this really long keychain. I was like, how do you get that? And she's like, well, you have to get the time and they'll give you the chips. And for the first time ever in my life, I couldn't buy it, right? Like I had to earn it. So I started going to meetings and chipping up, right? 30, 60, 90, six months, nine months, a year, right? Um, I had a sponsor. I had several sponsors because my sponsors kept going out and getting loaded. And I thought that that was because of me and that I was just too much for them. And I finally met this lady. She's about this high. She walked me through my first set of steps. She's this old like, uh, OG gangster lady. <laughs> and um, I remember my first fourth step, right? I was like, no, I don't want to do it. Like, I don't want to share with you any of that stuff. And she's like, 
you think that it's gonna be bad and it's not. She goes, tell me what you got. And after I told her she's all, is that it? <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, and so I started to realize that, you know, it wasn't so bad and to quit swimming against the current, right? Surrender. It's easier when you surrender. But then I take it back. So uh, I started dating this guy and he had a best friend and I asked her to be my sponsor and she's been my sponsor ever since. So for the last 12 years, I've had the same person. Um, I don't know about you guys, this is my story, but uh, my sponsor is also like my person, right? Like we fight um, like Dorothy and Sophia. Um, I'm part of her family. I'm an only child, but I, you know, family dinners, I get invited. Holidays, I get invited, right? Um, her mom tells me happy birthday. So I'm lucky if my own mom tells me happy birthday. Um, and so when me and that guy broke up, my sponsor lived up here. I thought it was the end of the world. It was my first heartbreak clean. I was like, oh my God. Um, but what I learned is like, you know, uh, when you're like the N.A. couple, right, and you break up, people take sides. And like the people that you think were your friends weren't your friends, right? And the women that stepped up and bugged the shit out of me every day so that I wasn't isolating were people I never imagined, right? But then I got caught up in something else because then I thought, oh, I'm hanging out with the cool people. And I started stepping away from recovery because I thought that social acceptability equaled recovery, and it doesn't. All it did was get in the way and it prevented me from um, the ability to uh, let the little girl inside me grow up, right? Because I had been hurt so much throughout my life that I like, I was in prison, my own self-imposed prison because I built these walls for people to not hurt me and I ended up isolating myself and not being vulnerable enough to let people in, right? I keep you right here, because if you're on this side, you're not right here. And if you're right here, you can hurt me. And I don't like that, I don't want that, right? But I still do things that are self-imposed crisis, right? Like I still act out my, um, I'm just not getting loaded. I'm just not picking up drugs, right? Guys are an addiction, right? Seeking that uh, validation and acceptance, right? Oh, he likes me. No, he doesn't. He just wants to have sex. Come on. Right? Um, shopping. Buying shit I don't need. You know, I don't need 27 purses. Right? I like them, but I don't need them. Um, tote bags. I have a thing about tote bags. I have so many freaking tote bags. Oh, my God. And I don't even know why. I think they look cute. I'm like, oh, I'll use it. No, I won't. You know where they are? They're in my spare bedroom in the closet that has turned into a storage unit. Um, food, right? I know that I can drive through McDonald's and grab a cheeseburger and fries and eat it. And then I hide the bag. I don't know who I'm hiding it from, but I hide the bag. Right? And I used to think that all of this was because I was high. I'm not high anymore, and I'm still cuckoo. I'm still crazy, and it's okay, you know? Um, May is mental health awareness, right? And so um, a couple years ago when the pandemic happened, um, I lost my shit. I was um, staying up for days on end because I was my anxiety was through the roof. My sponsor was like, nobody's allowed to show you any videos. They're not allowed to talk to you about anything because you go down the rabbit hole and you don't come back. I'm like, okay. And so I ended up going to see a therapist, right? And she put me on medication for depression and anxiety. And I felt some kind of way about that. And I share about this because I think it's something that needs to be talked about. And I think it's super important that people sitting in here, if you're struggling with it, talk about it. It's okay. And if you're not okay to talk about it with other people, get a hold of me. I'll listen to you. I have mental health. It's okay. Right? I didn't survive all the trauma of my life and not have something wrong with me. I have anxiety. I have complex PTSD. I have depression. 
And let me tell you, when things happen in the world, even though I know it's not in my control, I panic. I'm like looking up how to have a go bag and like if something happens and the world shuts down, what do I need? Like a battery operated, like a crank radio that will charge, you know, like it's ridiculous. Um, so my sponsor called me and said, hey, you know, um, where I work, they're hiring. And I'm like, okay. So I filled out the application and I was like, okay, I'm done with that. And then they're like, okay, we're gonna do the interview. And I'm like, okay, and I did that. And then it started to get real, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have to move. And she got in my ass. She's like, if you're not serious about getting this job, you should tell them and quit wasting their time. I'm like, I wanna move. I wanna move, right? And I did wanna move because listen, living in California, it's great. Southern California is awesome. Weather is great. You can go to the beach for Christmas. However, you got five people living in a house and we're all paying $1,000 because the rent is really high, right? I would rub two pennies together hoping a quarter popped out because it was ridiculous. The 405, uh, man, that's a homicidal freeway because I wanted to kill people on it daily. Um, and so I made a decision. I made a decision. A long, thought-out decision. Right? I drove to Fresno. I sat with my girls. I told them, I did a pros and cons with them, right? I'm like, this is what the opportunity is. This is what it looks like right now. This is what it could look like, right? Not that I needed their approval, but um, in 2017, I got a phone call that their dad was sick. And when they started telling me what was wrong, I already knew that he had cancer. He was diagnosed with stage four kidney cancer and it had metastasized. He went through chemotherapy. He, um, he was tired and he didn't want to fight anymore. Now, I never imagined that fast forward all these years after my dad died that I would be walking my kids through the, losing their dad, right? But that's a lived experience that I had and I got to share it with them. I also got to make an amends and I got to forgive that man, not for him, but for me. Because I wanted to make sure that when he left this earth, that we were good. And he told me, um, I'm proud of you. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it because the girls need you. So I moved up here. How do you all with everything I own? I felt like the Beverly Hillbillies had to leave the, the box springs on the side of the curb because they didn't fit. <laughs> and so I moved up here, right? And for the first time in, I don't know, five years, I was going to live on my own. And that was scary to me because I always had somebody at home, right? Like I lived with my friends and their daughter and like we had this routine, like I would go get her from school, I would bring her home, I would give her a bath, do dinner, clean the kitchen, like, you know, it was just like this thing. So learning to sit with self in my own place alone in the quiet, it was hard for me at first, right? I had to learn how to sit still. Fast forward a couple years and I'm going 100 miles an hour again, right? I'm like, I'm over here. I'm the vice president of our union. I'm the treasurer of area. I have a home group. I'm part of the convention committee. I'm here, there, and everywhere. Um, I have sponsees today. And I'm doing too much. I need to sit the fuck down, right? And so let me tell you what happened. On Saturday, I had a really bad headache. And I'm like, I just have a migraine, right? Now this is because I think I'm a doctor, yeah. right? I have a PhD that I don't really have. So I'm sitting there, and so by Tuesday when I go to work, my head is like pounding. It feels like it's in a vice. Um, my vision is blurry. I don't feel good. I feel like I'm gonna throw up. My blood pressure is 190 over 116. Ooh. I called a video person. She basically said, I'm not giving you any medication until you get an EKG. I'm like, oh, okay, fine. So I called Sarah. I said, I gotta go to the doctor. This is what's going on. She's like, okay, um, do you want me to go with you? I said, yeah. I said, you can drive. Cause I kind of already knew what was gonna happen. So we go to the urgent care. 
They take my blood pressure. The doctor comes in and says, I'm not going to do an EKG. I'm going to send you to the ER. And then she looked at me like I was in school. Do you know why? I'm like, yeah, you think I'm having a stroke. And I was scared, low key, I'm not gonna lie, I was scared. I thought I was having a stroke too. Not like a full on stroke, but like a TIA, like a baby stroke. Um, so we went to the ER and they did all this stuff. And um, basically it was a wake up call for me, right? So when I got up here, I talked about gratitude, right? Because I'm grateful that I'm being seen and not viewed. Because if I'm being viewed, that means I'm dead, right? My kids stuck a dagger in my heart because they said, mom, you scared us. We can't afford to lose another parent. And I share all of this because even though we're clean, even though I have 14 years, it doesn't mean that I still have some stinking thinking, right? And like my head likes to tell me that there's nothing wrong. I'm invincible. I'm superwoman and nothing's going to take me out. I survived addiction. I'm going to survive this too. And that's not the truth, right? The truth is, is that we do a lot of damage to our bodies when we get here and I don't pay attention to mine. If I'm not going Mach 3 with my hair on fire, then I'm not doing enough. So I made another decision that as my commitments come up, I'm going to let them go and I'm going to learn to sit still and pay attention to my body and start taking care of me, right? Because I live my life for everybody else for so long. I have a voice today, right? And I can learn to set boundaries and I can learn to say, I don't have to do that, right? I don't have to be here and there. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love to travel, but I don't have to be doing all the things all the time and it's perfectly fine. My preferred state of being today is in my pajamas and a house coat because I think I'm half and I sit on the couch with my dog and I watch TV, right? And that's my self care. For me, that is self care. Not having to talk to people because I have to talk to people every day, all day at work. I'm good, right? I'll be watching some murder mystery or something. I don't know. But um, I am super grateful for Narcotics Anonymous, and I'm super grateful that I had all these crazy things happen to me, and that um, I thought that things were gonna be one way, and they weren't, because if you wanna laugh, make plans, because God has jokes, right? So what I've learned today is that I don't have to tell people about themselves, right? I don't have to say shit about nothing. If it is not in my circle of control, then that means it's not my sink. So I'm not doing the dishes. And, uh, you know, somebody told me, like, does it have to be said? Does it need to be said by you? And does it need to be said right now? And the majority of the time, it's no. It's not my job to tell you, you know. Now, if you do something and you hurt my feelings, absolutely. Hey, you know when you do this, this is how you make me feel. So please don't do it again, right? Uh, I try not to get resentments because I don't want to have to apologize. I can say I'm sorry, I don't have a problem, but I don't like to. And I know that I'm not right. I am the captain of the USS wrong in a sea of rights, right? And I know that sometimes we wanna be so right that it comes off as righteous. I see you, thank you. And I don't wanna be that. I just wanna be a humble person, right? And I just wanna be a better version of Carmen tomorrow than I am today, right? And so I just stand up here as another addict in recovery that has a little bit more days strung together than some people. I'm not better than you. I fight every day just like you. And newcomers, if you're new, thank you. Thank you for coming and showing up for your recovery because I get reminded that it's still not working out there, right? 14 years is a long time from my last day using, but trust and believe I don't forget where I come from, right? I'm a dirt bag. I'll take your shit and then I'll help you look for it. Right? And I'll do all kinds of stuff to get what I need because that's just what we do. I know what works and I know what doesn't, right? Today, I go to meetings, maybe not like I should, but I, I have a home group and I go to meetings. I do step work, not like I should, but I do it. I talk to my sponsor, that I do all the time. I talk to her every day, right? God bless her because sometimes she probably don't want to answer the phone. Um, and I'm a mom today, I'm a grandma today, my grandkids have never seen me loaded. I'm a friend today and I'm able to show up for you, right? I'm able, like if you're struggling, I'm able to say, hey, how can I help you? How are you doing today, right? And not um, hijack the conversation and make it about me, right? I think a lot of people get caught up like that and I wanna know how are you? How are you, Roger? How was your day today, right? Or Jada, right? How was your day? Because that's important. I want, you know, my friends mean the world to me. Um, the members of Narcotics Anonymous mean the world to me. 
And I'm super grateful that you guys allowed me to come and share my story. Thank you. Can someone please come up and read?